Welcome back, everybody, to Who's Your Band? Um, this week, I haven't seen him in a little couple of weeks here now. Sean Morton joins us back again. Hey, I missed, I missed one episode out of 40, for Christ's sake. Jesus Christ. I know, break. But, but you know what? It, a lot of time has gone by because that last one we recorded was the day before Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's been beautiful not seeing your face for two weeks. I love it. I'm not going to lie. Well, I was going to say, I was going to send just some cutouts of me. And that way you can put them up like some stickers. And you can like the fat head your stickers so with, with your fat gigantic head fat head. Right, right. You know the shipping would be on that? I remember when I asked you for your address, you're getting like these ornaments with my face on them. Oh, that's great. You're, so you're going to you, make me convert to being a Jew and, and rip down my Christmas tree if, you have, if I have Christmas ornaments with your face on it. Well, listen, this guy is, he, he's one of our favorite bass players, man. He played in- Gene Simmons, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Gene Simmons. <laughs> and we're going to get to Gene Simmons a, a little later on. But you, the voice you heard is the great PJ Farley from Trickster. Give it up for PJ. Hey, PJ. I give it up for myself. Is that okay? You could do that totally. I do it all day. I do it every episode. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How you been, man? I'm doing great. All things considered. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, so, man. Let's get right into this. PJ, you're a Jersey guy, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, and 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 the band, you guys started out in the Jersey club scene, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, do you the remember all which club scene? All yeah, the all age, club like scene. mothers and Wayne, right? <laughs> well, no, right. not even. Really? What what clubs China did you club wind up playing? Hills, China Club in Hillsdale, Studio One in um, Newark. I guess it was right on the border of Newark. Yeah, and Newark, Newark, Belleville. Belleville, yeah. Um, Obsessions and Randolph. Oh, oh. I remember that place. Tons what of clubs. Butter, what a dump that field. place was. Did you ever come to Staten Island and play in, in a band there? One of the clubs? Uh, yeah. The band I was in before Trickster, a band called Prisoner. I used to play at Billy O's and uh, On Stage. Um, what else was there? Was there ever? No, it wasn't. I'm some. I'm some missing some so other places but so you were around during that time when like you know cover bands would play like the circuit they played the the new uh the new york new jersey circuit and play play the different clubs were you, were you part of that scene no no i was like when i was i was like 14 man i was not even old enough to get in the all ages clubs <laughs> Wow. God. so I, was playing in Staten Island. I was like you know going playing billy o's on a thursday at, you know midnight Having to go to school the next morning, you know, oh, was, for tests. But so. PJ, the reason why I asked is that you started early. Didn't you start playing professionally at around the age of sixteen? Technically, fifteen, I would say, but sixteen. <laughs> I signed my first record deal at sixteen. Wow! And you're from Paramus, right? That's what you guys are based out of. No, I'm from Ridgefield. Everyone else is from Paramus, so. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm from Union Hudson City, Corner. so we're Hudson County boys. Okay, yeah, right. Ridgefield, Ridgefield, right next door. Nice. Yeah, so. When you 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 start playing in these different bands, these different cover bands, how do you wind up with Trickster, and how does it go from being like a band that's playing the New Jersey circuits to wind up going on tour with like every major '80s band and and like, and like legendary bands that's still around today, and just making that leap from clubs to now arenas and stadiums. Um. Well, like I said, I was in a in a band before I joined Trickster, and we were playing the same clubs on the same nights over and over and over again every week. And just came time for them to make a change. And uh, I guess I just saw that I fit the suit, and Steve called me, asked me to join the band. And uh, at first, I reluctantly said yes <laughs> because I was such a I was kind of a metalhead back in the day, and uh, although I was. Not stupid. I saw Trickster even before I joined the band with drawing a lot of people in clubs. So, you know, it was probably part jealousy. But um, I wasn't stupid. I'm like, nah, it's a great band, great songs. I'm in. And it wasn't too much longer after that we met our managers who were really good friends with Cliff Bernstein and uh, Peter Mensch from Q Prime Management who manage, you name it. I mean, Def at that time, it was Def Leppard, Doc and Queensryche, Metallica. Tesla, um, 
and I can keep going at that point alone. And so he kind of took our managers under his wing and kind of mentored them because our managers were uh, brand new and we were their first and only band and we had a good buzz going. And so Q prime management said, all right, well, we're going to help you out with these guys because we think it's cool and they legitimately have something going on here. So, and then once we got signed, it was off to the races. So when you first, you get signed, did you record and then go out on the road uh, as a support act or did you go out before the record was even released? No, we made the record first and then, you know, in traditional cycle, do the record, then go out and, you know, promote it, go out on tour. Back in the day when if you were signed, it was like, okay, make your record, get your nice fat budget, make your record. Then they put you on a tour bus and they pay for everything and everything's great. And make your videos and get right onto MTV. <laughs> hmm. well, that, well, that was the thing. I mean, you guys, I remember uh, seeing you guys on MTV. I, what was it? Uh, Give it to me good. I think that was like the, 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 the big single. What did MTV, how did it propel uh, Trickster's <sighs> career? Game changer. I mean, night and day. Once you once you're on TV, man, it's it's a it's a whole different ball game. It doesn't matter what field you're in, man. If you're on TV, it's a different level. I remember Stephen Adler telling me that one day. Not not that I'm name dropping, but we were having dinner one night, and he's this was while he was doing celebrity rehab, and he's like, we we're just talking about the thing, and he's like, fucking. Guns N' Roses, as big as it was, is when you're a, when you're a television star. He's like, I'm getting so much attention off this TV show, this you know one hour a week TV show about being in rehab. He's like, it's on another level. And he, the guy was in Guns N' Roses, right? <laughs> the biggest bands of all time. I mean, in the peak. And he was like, forget it. Being a television, totally different level. So MTV is. You're kind of a movie star for three and a half minutes. But, you know, if you're in heavy rotation like we were, you're, right. every, you know, three and a half minutes every hour. So what does it do? You're you're playing, what, are, you, are you going from a support act to a headlining act, a co-headlining act? Are you playing yes, no, 3,000? We, we were lucky enough to do, we kind of jumped right onto the support act of arena acts. And... Um, even some, some of the mid, uh, some of the bigger club. Like we started out opening up for Striper and Don Doc, and then immediately went from Poison, Scorpions, uh, you know, Warrants, uh, you know, so on. Um, so we we kind of nestled up in that support act, which we were totally fine with. I mean, we had one record at the time, so we were like, you know, let's just build this thing. You know, let's go out, kick ass for a half hour or forty five minutes, slay the dragons, and uh, you know, hopefully they'll come see us when we come around by ourselves. You were involved in, in two uh, mildly embarrassing stories of mine. <laughs> and I'd well, like to talk just two for now. I'm going to tell you about one. And then after we, after we get done talking about Trickster, we'll talk about the second one because they're in two different parts. Um, I had a band a long time ago. The yeah, same thing, local Jersey scene, whatever. So me and my drummer go out to support our bass players, other bands. And they were kind of heavier than we were. So we were at this, this little bar in Bergenfield and I'm driving him back to Jersey City. So my, my CD player's on shuffle. And, you know, now we're rocking out to like, you know, Testament and Motorhead and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, Surrender comes on. <laughs> Perfect. And so he looks at me and I look at him and he's like, I'm like, you want me to skip? He goes, no, I'm only if you want to skip the song. The Tommy Boy moment. I'm all right with it. It was basically right. like, so here you are. Now, mind you, it's probably 2000. You're seeing my little tiny drummer and me flying down Route 80, screaming surrender at the top of our lungs. This is in 2000? Oh, yeah. Look, I'm wow. an 80s brat, too. The uh, plot thickens. The plot thickens, yes. Uh, screaming uh, surrender every every word word for word at the top of our lungs and we both looked at each other and said we're never going to talk about this ever again right he goes absolutely not until I texted him the other day and I said guess who I'm interviewing 
on the podcast this week and I told him, he goes, bro, you have to tell the fucking story. <laughs> and he was, he, he loved it. It was, it was a great moment, but, uh, that do that album is still in my rotation. It's still thousand, <laughs> and you're still yeah. Crazy. It's still on my rotation because you know I, I always say this. One guest, I I can't remember who it was. I think it was Billy Vera who said that the music you listen to at 13 or 14 is the music that defines you for the rest of your life. So I was 13 when that album came out. So for me again it's always the poison warrant skid row tesla bullet boys trickster bon jovi era that no matter what kind of music i evolve into whether it's you know hate breed or black label society or anything like that it always gets pushed to the side because the 80s metal always takes the forefront yeah it's just a happy era for music too it is man it's a Look, there's something to be said about endorphins and, you know, it, music, uh, depending on what you listen to, affects the chemistry in your in your mind. And if you're listening to grunge, I mean, I remember there was a period where I was just listening to, you know, darker stuff, you know, back when it was popular and stuff and I'm listening to it, and a lot of good stuff, but it was dark. And it was like, and I remember kind of I'm like, I think I'm a little depressed. Yeah. And like, I remember putting on something that I hadn't heard in a while. Like, I don't remember what record, but it was like, you know, from a, from the early nineties or late eighties, I'm like, fuck, I'm a new man. <laughs> like, that's, that's right. The music has a profound and physical effect on your mental state. Absolutely. So I mean, it, and oh, it, yeah. music is a, a direct connection physically. That's why it means so much to people. That's why it's, um, it, it's like magical in the sense that when people meet musicians and artists and people who wrote songs that are embedded in their brains and in their DNA, they're like, you know, they don't know what to say. And they like, you know, freeze up. And it's like, you know, we're just kind of people who, you know, perform, the, perform those songs, but, you know, delivering that message to somebody and it being received like someone like yourself, um, it has a way of transforming you. If you heard the song now, it gets you, gets you the same reaction as when you were listening to it every day when you heard it for the first time. Oh, yeah. Like, I could still smile and be happy listening to Cherry Pie by Warrant, and then I can put on Rape Me by Nirvana and realize I was that really depressed mid-teen wearing the flannel and hating in the world. So, like, it always brings me back to a better, a better happier spot, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Speaking of happy spots, um, PJ, how special was it for you when the band starts to take off and you wind up performing at the Meadowlands for the first time, being a Jersey guy, and now you're playing like the premier New Jersey arena? You know, can, can you explain that feeling? Did people hit you up for tickets? What, what What's that kind of like? Yeah, that was obviously, I mean, you guys are from Jersey, you know the deal, it's that was the place. I'm that, a Staten Island guy. That's why I asked you the Staten Island question. All right, sir. Same deal. You know the deal. There's no room. <laughs> Jersey with a cover charge. <laughs> for, for the garden. But, um, you know, that was the place we all, you know, my at least I grew up. I grew up 15 minutes away from the place. I always went to shows there. That's where I, for, I saw my first shows. Anytime I drove by it, I had to look at it. I had to get a glimpse of it. I always had to see it. You know, I remember dirt bike riding in uh, the dunes over there and I could see it and I would just look at it any chance I got. It's like, I'm like, I'm going to play there. That's, you know, it was, that was the goal. So when we first got the Scorpions tour and we got the itinerary and, you know, anytime, you know, we would make our decision on a tour based on what's the routing. Whereas you are, you were looking for East Rutherford, Uniondale, Philadelphia, those three, that block, on every itinerary, he was like, all right, where's, the, where's that cluster? Uniondale, Philadelphia, East Rutherford, you know, had to see it. And I remember seeing it for the first time and going, you know, just not really believing it. And then obviously it was, it was just like the countdown. Once we, from the minute we got on the Scorpion store to the, the day of that show, it was just like, that was the zenith for us. It was just like, you know, 
<laughs> who came to see it? Was it your mom, dad, brothers, sisters? Like, all, all the above, and then some. That that's yeah. that's that's amazing, man. And you guys also went on tour with Kiss, right? Yep. So, did you get a chance to meet Gene Simmons? And if you did, what was Gene like? Uh, yes. <laughs> He's not as good as a bass player. I'll tell you that right now. But continue. Oh, Gene's great. Man. Fucking sorely underrated. Um, sorely underrated and big influence on me. Um, Gene is awesome. He is. I mean, you know, he gets a bad rap for you know things that he really pays attention to um, a little too much money but i'll tell you great guy to hang out with and has a huge heart very funny generous um and approachable you know in in any way shape or form Just did you learn something from him with, what's that did you learn something from him um, something about the business, something that, something that you that you know going on that tour it took you took with you for the rest of your career. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think just because I've met him a couple of times before we went on tour, but you know, just seeing how he was with us in particular, you know, he would always go, "PJ, my illegitimate son," you know, or like you know, just <laughs> just really cool to us and to to all the bands. That's good to hear. Tour. Whereas you know. You know, he was Gene Simmons and he didn't have to be like that. You know, um, he just really made us feel welcome. And when you're on tour with a legend like that, you know, who has a reputation of, you know, kind of being. That's he why I asked. Nice. He was one of the coolest people I've ever met as far as celebrities go, I will tell you. Because, yeah. again, you're absolutely right. He gets a very bad rap. And when I met him, he was just like, are you a fan? And I go, well, yes, I am. Well, what's your favorite Kiss song? I said, it's unholy. He goes, that's a good pick. I wrote that one. <laughs> and then like, you know, took a picture of my wife and he has, she has her arm around him and he goes, no, no, honey, it's much lower. He moves her arm and puts it right, his hand right on his, on his ass. So the picture of her is like, what the fuck is going on? And then like, it's a picture of him smiling. He was a really, really cool, you know, dude, very down to earth. You know, PJ, speaking of legends, you guys also collaborated with, with, with the, the legendary um, uh, Edgar Winter. How did that come about? Because, that, you know, these guys from New Jersey with Edgar Winter, I mean, you know, free ride. I mean, remember the Edgar Winter band? That's what I used to listen to growing up. So that, I mean, and that's like a weird pairing. I, I you know, I didn't see that. Yeah. You know, it was just something our, our guy who produced a song, knew him. And the song called, you know, for uh, for some great sax. And um, he, uh, I remember me and my manager went to go pick him up at his place in Santa Monica at his apartment. It was awesome. Too. Yeah, we're going to go pick up Edgar Winter at his house now. It was great. It was such a trip. But yeah, I didn't talk about a legend. Frankenstein, right? And, uh, right, right, right. Frankenstein. And you know, this, you mean, I guess you're no stranger to legends either, because when the band, I don't know, either broke up or took a hiatus or whatever it was, didn't you join Lita Ford's band for a number of years? Yeah, um, that came. I mean, we put Trickster back together in 2008, and then I think I joined Lita in 2009, and I was with her till like the beginning of 2012. Oh, that's, that's, and did you know her prior to that, or no, I mean, um, I mean, I'd met her you got one audition. Um, yes and no. It was, so I got a call. I was, went and sat down um, for my birthday dinner. It's my birthday, my wife's birthday, her brother's birthday, and my in-laws' wedding anniversary. All June eighth. So we sit down. It's a big, huge dinner, right? And I get a call uh, from a buddy of mine, Danny Stanton from New York. And he's like, uh, you need to call Jim Gillette, leaving he's a bass player, like ASAP. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, sorry, guys, you're going to take this call. So I call, you know, her husband at the time, Jim. And he's like, yeah, we're going to Europe. We got all these festivals booked and some shows in the States. And the fucking bass player doesn't have his passport. And, you know, we're leaving whatever, whenever it is. And uh, can you learn 15 songs in a day? I'm like, I'd like to think that I can. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, it was, I don't know, it was like a Wednesday. He goes, get, you know, get cracking. We'll see you here on Friday. I flew down to her house. Wow. A day and a half later. And 
after I hung up the phone with him, he calls me back. He's like, so, you know, before I got your number and I, I put a call, a couple of calls into a couple other guys. And, you know, this one guy finally got back to me and kind of told him he could come and play too. Would it be all right if you kind of both come down and play and we just kind of pick and, you know, we'll pay you for your time and everything. But, you know, this way, you know, it's fair because he called me back and everything. I'm like, sure, no problem. So as it turns out, and meanwhile, it's funny because I walk in, he, Jim picks me up from the airport. We go to our house and Bumblefoot's in the band. He's playing and his drummer, Ron, um, uh, I forgot the drummer's name. Um, the band's playing, lead is playing. I didn't even meet anybody. Just got in, put my bass on, start playing, right? No hellos, nothing. You know, you start playing like, maybe like, a, I don't know back to the cave or something like that, or something unusual. Now, did you really know the songs? Were you able to learn 15 songs in one day? Yo, yeah. Background vocals, everything. I came, I came fucking game face. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, all right. So what'd you do? I mean, hold on a second. So did you stop the dinner and just say, I got to get to work right away because I got to leave like almost like the next day to learn these songs. Did you go right into your home studio and just start learning 15 songs? No, I went, you know, Went to dinner, probably had <laughs> bottles of wine. And uh said, well, you know, I was waiting for him to send me the material. Oh, okay. So I, I was at, you know, there was nothing I could do really. I didn't know set. I didn't know anything. He's like, all right, I'll send you, I'll send you, you know, the files. So it was just a waiting game. So, I mean, luckily my one strong point is, you know, I always say anyone can play the bass in most people's bands. If you're a bass player or you, or even a guitar player, I mean, you could probably play the bass to, you know, any pop rock or hard rock band, you know. I mean, Why is that? You, you got, well, I mean, I'm speaking relatively, but, you know, if you're playing an instrument, you call yourself a musician, you know, to play, say, Kiss Me Deadly, it, it's not brain surgery, you know. I mean, anyone can play those bass lines, you know, or anything in most pop music. Um, but being able to retain play it the way it's supposed to be played, sing backgrounds, and also not look at any cheat sheets and perform it the first time you play it. Not just go, okay, and then what do we do, the bridge next? Or, you know, so I would say my, kind of my strength is I can learn somebody's set in as long of time or as short a time as you give me. And I'll come, you know, ready to play. You know, I'm not going to be sitting there because I'm blind as a bat to begin with. So even if there were cheat sheets, I couldn't fucking see them. So <laughs> I'm like, you know what? I'm going to digest this music and I'll play it like I mean it, you know, the minute I get there and just come stage ready because you can really get anyone to play the songs, but you got to come prepared. So hence back to the uh, audition, I only do like two or three songs. And then the other guy comes in while I'm playing. I'm like, all right. The other guy comes in. And I'm, I go out. Did you know the other guy? No. Um, actually, I knew the band. I think I, in this other band I play in Ra, we did a festival with this band, like Boy Something, I forget the name of the band. He comes in and, and so I leave, lurking around the backyard. Making it's like something calls. out of the movie Rockstar. It, it's, it's definitely a story. And then I hear them playing like, you know, Kiss Me Deadly and like Close My Eyes. I'm like, oh man, he's doing the hits. <laughs> I'm to like, you know, keep cuts. I'm like, oh, whatever. <laughs> I'm here, free trip to Florida, whatever. But it turns out I got the gig. Um, and that's because I think I knew all the songs and all the backgrounds. I was just prepared, you know. Um, once I did get the material, I fucking learned it, you know. Uh, and I don't know if the other guy didn't, you know, listen to it enough or something, but. A little cocky, maybe? I don't know. No, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell if it was cocky for it was just like, yeah, you know, I'll get it by the time show comes around. But, you know, the way I see things, it's like if somebody's asked me to come play with them, I'm not going to show up and go, yeah, but by the time we get on stage, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, no, we're ready now. <laughs> right. Let's go. Now, now, did you play in Raw from the very beginning? Um, funny story. I was asked to, but a friend of mine had introduced me to Sahaj, the singer. Mm-hmm right around the time he was looking to get a record deal and asked me to kind of play with him. He's like, at least do some shows. We have some showcases coming up. And I'm like, all right, well, send me some songs. He sent me like, do you call my name and rectifier and 
all the you know big songs off their first record. I'm like, oh man, these fucking songs are great. But at that time, Steve and I, Steve Brown, we had a band together that we were just on the cusp of getting a record deal with. And we were kind of just on the verge of striking lightning twice. I'm like, man, I'll do these shows with you, but I can't join the band. As much as I really dig this stuff, I got so much invested in this and we're real close. I'm like, you know, but somewhere down the line, if you know, you need me to try me again. But right now I just can't do it timing wise. And then cut to like six or seven months later, they had gotten signed, made that first record, started touring. And then I get a call from them. You know, so this was in December. He called me for the first time. I think he called me in May and he's like, look, I'm in the middle of a tour right now with Stone Sour, Power Man 5000, and I got to get rid of my bass player. You got to come out now. So basically, same scenario. Learn the entire set and fly out to Omaha, Nebraska in 48 hours. Wow. So, and I didn't meet the band or anything. Met on the bus 10 minutes before we went on stage. And, uh, you know, see you guys on the ice. Let's get it there. Does playing the bass come naturally to you, or something that you have to really work at and practice at a lot? Or did you start off as a guitar player and switch to bass? I started out as a drummer, actually. So I, I think rhythmically, I'm always kind of like bobbing and weaving and tapping my foot and air drumming. And you know, my first love was drums. I started out playing drums at an early age, and then I stopped when I decided to start a band. And all my friends wanted to play every other instrument except bass. So I'm like, well, fuck it. I'll just be the bass player. So that's when I started playing bass at 11. Um, so I think I just played it just out of necessity. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was always drawn to it because it was kind of mysterious. It was like this cool, I always knew that was the thing you felt um, when you listen to music, but you didn't really pay attention to, but that was a You thing. felt the connection to it. Right. That was the thing that went right here, especially when you start going to live shows. Right. That was the thing that made you rumble. That was the thing that you really felt. It wasn't the guitars and that pitch. That was great and all, but when you feel that bass, that was the thing that moved you. And I was like, that's fucking cool. And that's all coming from that guy that no one's looking at. I'm like, that's what I want to do. You know who, Jeff, you know who says that? Bass players. Nobody else says that. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Speaking of drums, though, PJ, it brings up my second story. Um, Sugar Belly. Yeah. So, Jeff, I don't know if you ever heard of this band, Sugar Belly. Uh, but back in like the late 90s, uh, cover bands were gigantic in New Jersey. I mean, there was bands like them, the Benjamins. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, of course. You know, Big Orange Cone, all these big bands. Yeah, and and I saw the you, Benjamins. you would just go out and in fact, dog voices. Like, sh- Sean, we had the Benjamins at um, in Linden. They came in. It was it was. Listen to this lineup. It was the Benjamins, Rob Bass. You know, it takes two. Uh huh. And then in between them, it was me, Rich Voss, and Sean Donnelly. These are comedians, PJ. I would have. We're both comedians, uh, PJ. By the way, what is this? <laughs> yeah, that's the weirdest thing. But so my second embarrassing moment was you on the drums. Uh, with Sugar Belly, and I believe now, if memory serves me right, now I might be wrong. You had a female drummer, correct? Yeah. Okay, and then she would switch out and sing, and you would go and play drums on Highway to Hell. Right. Okay. Cadillac Bar in Hoboken. Uh, I'm going to preface by saying I'm a little intoxicated at the time. I'm going to I'm going to concur and agree, and also state the same. Okay. So it's one of those moments. And this happened to me one other time where my wife took me to see the who and she paid, she bought tickets to see Quadrophenia because I was just getting into the who, and this is years after this incident. (laughs) And it was about 13 songs in and the music had just died. And then, you know, people are starting to like not cheer. And all of a sudden, all you hear is her voice going, can you play a fucking hit already? (laughs) <laughs> and the whole place booed the shit out of her. But it was a similar situation with this is that you guys are rocking out. I'm there with my buddy and I'm a little fucked up. And as soon as the song is just about over, this girl walks by and she was not pretty to look at. And I just happened to blurt out, oh, my God, I fucked that. And everybody in the bar turns around and looks at me and the girl is crying hysterical now. And now I was uh, banned from the Cadillac bar after that night. 
Really? Because yeah, they threw me out right. of the kind of like bar. If, if if they banned everybody who said that in that bar, they had nobody in there. That's very true. That was a, a very bleak moment in my life, PJ. And uh, just so you know, had you uh, did a little drum fill, I probably wouldn't have been embarrassed. Did I catch it? Was I behind the drums when you said it? You were behind. The, you were behind the drums. You had just finished the song. Yes. So that was a fun band, though. I have to admit that was that a fun time for you doing that doing the oh, cover band thing. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun, especially that Cadillac bar. Mm-hmm. We were the house band there on Sunday nights. It was. It was a Sunday, PJ. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I used to call it "Piss Yourself Sunday," where oh. it said everyone's allowed to get so drunk you can piss yourself, and we're not allowed to judge you. That's great. Jeff, did you ever go there? Uh, yeah, I, th- I think um, there was a guy named David Suarez who uh, used to put on shows there on Wednesday nights. So I used to get up and uh, do sets over there. I don't mean comedy dope. I mean as for to see bands. Oh, no, I never went there to see oh. it. You know, it, it's, a, it's always a hard, coming from Staten Island, it was always like a pain in the neck to get to Hoboken. And there was never any parking. You know, it was, it, it, it was just like a... You know, we, we had different alternatives here. You know, we had the Rock Pals, we had Snoopy's. You know, I go sometimes go to uh, Brooklyn, go to Lemoore's. So uh, I kind of drift, and, and then sometimes I go into the city. So I would do that. Uh, PJ, are you a comedy fan? Of course. Yeah. And didn't you also play with uh, Brewer for a while? Yeah, sure did. Oh, you did the whole. Okay. So do you know Paul Bond then? Who? No, exactly. <laughs> no, no, we did this. We did this for about a year, um, maybe three years ago, maybe something. We did the uh, Paramount Theater uh, residency oh, sure. with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The residency. A. Steve Brown, Joey Casada were the backup band. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it was awesome. It's a, there's always a great correlation. We always talk because we're both stand up comics, and you know, there's always this weird sort of, sort of like sonic connection between stand up comics and musicians for some reason. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we're all tortured and we're all, you know, <laughs> we're, you know, you guys all think you're musicians. We all think we're comedians. <laughs> Very That's true. That is that true. Is I'm true. a good, I'm a good, I'm a good comedian and a shitty musician. And Jeff is, uh, oh, I'm a, I'm a, he was a, in the Irishman. I don't know if you knew that. He yeah, was, was in the, movie the Irishman. Irishman. No, yeah. fucking great. Yeah. yeah so, so that tells you something about my comedy career that uh, I'm doing a drama, <laughs> right? <laughs> I do want to bring up one thing, which actually, and I'm not saying it surprised me, but I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I fucking love your new album that you just put out. Oh, thank you. I well, absolutely well, love it. First of all, I'm going to be, I'm going to say, I'm embarrassed to know that you did, that I didn't know that you did two solo albums. I mean, and I, you know, I went back and uh, the first one is great. That second one, man, let me tell you, I'm a big fan. And I don't know if you've ever heard this, uh, like uh, influence or correlation. I had a, a really big collective soul vibe come off that second album. Well, I do get a lot of uh, 90s kind of influence. I, people say it reminds me of that. So it, that, that kind of era, mm-hmm. you know. I really dug album. it. Now, did you, uh, you wrote all the stuff on the album? Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's who were the, cool. who were the uh, other musicians that were on that with you? Uh, <clears throat> the first one was just is all me. The second one, uh, there's a couple songs that are all me. Um, I had my singer from Ra on like four of them, do some guitar and some stuff. Where he produced uh, four of the songs on it. Oh, cool. Um, I had uh, Steve Brown do a guitar solo and some background vocals on one song. Um, you see Ken Slusher, who plays drums for Luke Bryan. He's mm-hmm. on drums on one song. Um, and an uh, en- engineer I worked with at Mi- uh, Detroit, Michigan, um, Chuck Alcazian, played drums on two songs. Um, and the rest of it's kind of me. I did a lot of the guitar and uh, some of the drums. Um, but yeah, this one I just kind of, I wanted other hands on it. You know, I mean, I did everything on the first record and it's out of necessity, you know, um, cause I, and I did it all at Steve's house when I did that first record. So it wasn't like making a record when I made that first record, I was just recording songs. We were mm-hmm. up there writing, recording. I'm like, I got this one, but it's not good for whatever we're doing now. I said, let me just lay it down. 
You know, I mean, my songs are on brain surgery, so I can get it done on the drums. And I know all the guitar parts. Um, this one, I just kind of wanted, you know, different feels and people a little bit better than me, on, you know, when I could get them. So where'd you record it? Uh, all over the place. I did a couple of songs in L.A., a couple in um, Michigan, one mm -hmm. or two in Nashville, one oh, or two wow. here in Jersey. When you were in Nashville, did you record at uh, Mitch Malloy's studio? Mitch Malloy's studio? No. Yeah. Yeah, we had him on as a guest. Um, oh, actually, like, actually, the day before uh, Eddie passed, oh, we, yeah. had, we had uh, Mitch on, and he was telling us about uh, his recording studio in uh, Nashville. Um, what I want to ask you as well is, um, I mean, you go, you guys go way back with Trickster. He, in 2020 now are you guys still friends you guys still stay in touch is everybody like like you know they you know still tight what what's what's the relationship between the guys in the band now um well steve and i are always working together we've you know through thick and thin we've always been kind of attached to the hip you know still are always will be um pete and gus live in arizona so we don't see them um steve and i haven't heard from gus in probably well over two years. Um, but we, you know, we're uh, communicating with Pete every once in a while too via text or, you know, some sort of message in some way, shape or form. So uh, that line of communication is still open and, uh, but we have not heard from Gus. Um, Are you gonna send him a Christmas card? <laughs> uh, he's Jewish, so. <laughs> um, okay, happy but, holidays, uh, New Year's. <laughs> yeah, and they're out there in the, in the desert. Hmm. Well, we're starting to freeze over here. Right. And right now, currently, like, you know, during the pandemic, I heard, were, were you uh, jamming with uh, Chris Jericho and doing like a Kiss cover band or something like that? Is that what I, is that right? It is correct. It's actually, I got, I got the best of both worlds. So hmm. I got this thing. It's me, Chris, Kent from Luke Bryan's band and Joe McGinnis, who plays in the classic 78. And uh, we do... It's, 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 hold on a second. it's funny how like this like how like the people you kind of like collaborate with like <laughs> you know it, it's like it just seems like how the hell does pj Foley hook up with, with chris jericho how does he hook up with, with lita ford and edgar which is a great it's, fucking bass player that's why you I know but it's just like like you just like never picture these two people together working on the same project and they that's are better. so how, how did that whole thing uh, get together you and um, chris well i've known chris for a long long time and uh how do you know him through eddie trunk because chris is a big trickster fan huge trickster fan and a huge music fan in general, but yeah. big trickster fan. And I think we just did, I think Steve and I did Eddie Trunk's show on 104 or 102 years ago. And he's like, well, That I'm was when they did the show in the evening, like right? The guy got yeah, Friday, yeah. Saturday yeah. night. Yeah, I remember like, listening going, when I would going to be Friday, traveling. Going to Fridays in Rutherford, you know, Chris just wrestled. He would love to meet you guys when to come down for dinner. So we went over there, had dinner with him. And, uh, you know, that was shit. I couldn't even tell you what year that was, but uh, maybe 2003 or something like that. And, uh, you know, just kind of stayed in contact. And Kent and Joe from the band Quarantine, which is the name of this Kiss cover band, were messing around with a song called No, No, No. And it's got this big drum fill in the intro. So Kent videoed it, sent it to Jericho and goes, Hey, name the song. He's like, in two seconds, he's like, no, no, no. You guys need a singer. And the, so cause Kent and Joe was just going to do it just put it up on YouTube and just have you know fun. This is the beginning of uh, lockdown. So Kent's like, well, actually, yeah, we do. And actually we need a bass player. He's like, I know just the guy. They had two songs they wanted to do. They want to do no, no, no. And heart of Chrome. So Chris is like, yeah, I know the guy. And actually he toured with Kiss on Revenge. So wow. even better. So that uh, relationship was formed, which is great because we do just Bruce Kulick era Kiss. That's fantastic. But then not long after that, I get a call to do a remake of Mr. Speed with Charlie Benante, John Five, and also Joe McGinnis. So we did that. And then we just released last week, the same group, me, Charlie, John, and Joe, uh, cover of uh, all, the, uh, all the Way. Oh, wow. And uh, 
So I got my 80s Kiss and my 70s Kiss tributes going on. That's great. Charlie, Charlie Benanti, I believe, is like probably the most underrated musician on the planet right now. People don't realize they think it's just like the drummer from Anthrax. The dude is the is the best guitar player in friggin' Anthrax. Number one, <laughs> artist, you know, or he's an artist too. He's he's unbelievable. He blows me away with some of the stuff that he posts on Facebook during this quarantine. I gotta tell you, like I, I've said this to Jeff before, during this uh, horrible horrible shitty situation that we're all in, some amazing music has really come out of this. Agreed. And stuff and stuff that you would never even imagine, like seeing like, you know, Charlie posting these videos all the time. Uh, we've had other guests who have come on and, and they've, you know, they do these killer, killer, they're getting hundreds of thousands of views from people who probably would never see them considering the fact that they're home now just on Facebook and then people are forwarding things and stuff like that. But I really think that this is a, a great year for music, no matter what. I mean, we were talking about, we were joking around before we went on the air, but my favorite album of the year so far is Miley Cyrus's new album. Oh yeah. It's, 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 it's a really good album. Like I, I was that, very it's actually surprised. Pretty good. It's not, was, when did it come out? Uh, two weeks ago. I mean, she's got songs with uh, Joan Jett and, and Billy Idol and, and Stevie Nicks. And, you know, you'd never think that during this horrible time that a great album like that would come out. I don't know. I mean, she's got potential to work with the greatest people out there. So sure. I mean, I like some, I like a lot of the stuff that she did before that. So yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. What was your favorite album this year so far? Uh, mine. Besides that. Um, Um, no, I came out last year. Fuck this year blew by. Did anything new come out this year yet? Um, no, one, yeah, right. yeah, ACDC. What, what am I missing? I haven't heard the whole thing yet, but oh my god, but, um, Shine of Dark. It's I love it. It's unbelievable. What I heard so far is just perfectly ACDC. I love it. Um, shit, I know there's something I'm missing. Here. Corey Taylor. I've only heard two songs off of that. Yeah. yeah. It's a great solo album because, you know, one of the things I love about that album is that there's like six different genres in that record. Well, Corey's also, I mean, you know, he's, uh, it's funny when I first joined Rob back to that, we were on tour with Stone Sour and one of the first nights I was on tour with them, I was like, you know, you know, that was like my, I joined Raw and I got thrust into this active rock world where I'm on tour with Stone Sour and then we're doing these radio festivals. I'm playing with you know, Audio Slave and, you know, Seether and Seven Dust and all these, I'm in a new, I'm in a new world, basically, yeah. right? And I'm like out there in this, you know, active rock band and I'm selling it, you know, I, I mean it, but I'm like, it's just different. It took a little bit of adjustment. I'm like, okay, I know that nobody knows me from Trickster, you know, and I remember talking to Corey going, you know, this is his first venture outside of Slipknot without the mask and now he's out performing for people who know who he is but you know and I was like how does that you know work for you is it, you know are you uh, acclimated to it and everything and I was telling him I'm like you know I come from you know the band Trickster he goes motherfucker I know exactly who you are I saw you twice I have yeah. your covers record I have all your fucking records are you kidding I know who you are that's and great I, I, you know he's a big you know 80s metal fan and he's got you know, just not 80s metal, but he has a, he celebrates all music. Yeah. So you hear that. You hear that a lot on his new album. Doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's some pop songs on there. There's some, some really heavy, uh, like Stone Sourish. Kind of, you can hear, you can actually hear like two or three songs that like, all right, he definitely wrote them for Stone Sour and they just didn't work for some reason. He re-recorded it. He's got some hardcore stuff on there, some punk stuff. And some radio friendly stuff. I mean, honestly, it's it's one of my top five of the year. It really is. So if you really gotta check it out, it's it's a it's a solid if I buy the thing on digital first and then I go out and buy it on vinyl second, it's a good record. That's how I always judge That's it. That's the telltale sign, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey PJ, are you guys uh, thinking about uh, after quarantine is over and say thing, you know, we get this vaccine and things start to loosen up in the spring and summer? Is this band that you work with now you guys think you know, think about staying together and touring and doing some uh, stuff well, some uh, live stuff yes 
Um, we talked about doing some shows. Uh, maybe we maybe we can get it together, but obviously we all have a lot of other things going on. And once the ship is up and running, everyone's going to be really busy. I mean, Ken's going out with Luke. Um, you know, Chris and I will be going out and playing with Fozzie. So we'll be going out with Fozzie. Um, uh, so, I mean, there'll be a lot going on. And I play with Eric Martin from Mr. Big, too. Uh, and Ra, Ra has a new record coming out. So I would love to make some time for some quarantine shows if, if you know, if we can make it happen. Um, might be tough, but no one's opposed to it. We talked about it already. And in that Kiss set, is there any chance you'll be doing it? Because I love um, the song uh, Hide Your Heart. Uh-huh. Do, I, is it on the playlist? Well, we're kind of... Again, we're going. We're sticking with kind of Bruce, uh, obviously Bruce Kulick era, but more of the less celebrated kiss yeah. songs. The deep cuts. Yeah, deep cuts. I deep know cuts. it was a single. I mean, great song, but um, you know, it was a single. It's kind of predictable. Well, next time that you talk to Chris, let him know that there's a fat, chubby, hysterical comic who's a wrestling fanatic who wants to work his Kiss Cruise as a uh, Chris uh, Jericho Rock and Rager on the fucking Seas Cruise next year. Because he doesn't answer my goddamn emails. I'll tell you that right now. What does that tell you, Sean? It means I'm a nobody in this business <laughs> is what it tells me. Exactly. Listen, that PJ. Booked, well, that thing was supposed to go out. We were supposed to go out. We were leaving... February. Yeah, I think it pushed I mean, back to October, it was, November, right? It was booked, I think, in May already. And then obviously got pushed back to October. But the, I mean, the lineup was secured for almost a year ago. I know. A couple months after we get off the first one, or the last one, I should say. What kind of experience is that, though? Kind of like uh, the mixing of the wrestling and the rock and roll kind of vibe in that kind of cruise? It's kind of cool, actually. You know, my first, I've never done a cruise up until this year. And I did this year, I did Jericho's cruise. And then four days later, I went and did Chip Rock with Ra. So I got my cruise fix on. <laughs> what a great year to go on fucking cruises, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but I didn't get sick. I think I was the only one in two bands that I traveled with on cruises. And I'm the only one who didn't get sick. But the rock and wrestling cruise was cool because... Um, we were kind of the, the after party, you know, we were the sideshow, you know, it was about wrestling really. Yeah. Uh, and we were there to just kind of supply the tunes and, you know, give people something to do in between matches. <laughs> you know, um, that's cool though. That was kind of cool where on the flip side, you know, then I get off one ship and get on another one and do ship rock when it's all about the music. And, you know, there's a little less freedom in the sense that you walk around and, you know, I'm not Jericho cruise. Nobody gives a shit who the band <laughs> really, you know, you go on ship rock and it's whole, totally different. Ball yeah. Def, definitely a different vibe, right? But PJ, where could people find you? Um, on Instagram at PJ Farley, Facebook, uh, PJ Farley music, um, Twitter, PJ Farley. One. I don't know. You just Google that shit. <laughs> my name in. I'm really easy to find. Listen, man, we hope you stay well and we wish you, you know, the best holidays. And we really appreciate you taking a little time out and uh and no talking with us, man. We're, we're both we're both fans, we're both fans of of Trickster and the music. And you know, um hopefully we can do this again sometime. Anytime. Thanks, Thanks a lot, BJ. I appreciate it. Get the new album, get it on iTunes, support local music, support independent music. That's the most important thing. Please. Amen. All right, everybody. We will be back next week with a brand new uh, Who's Your Band? Uh, Sean Morton. Take care. Once again, big thank you to our guest, PJ Farley. And uh, check him out, folks. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye, everybody. See you guys. Later.